Hey everybody, welcome back to my reviews of Doctor Who Flux, starring the backlight that I forgot I had until this very moment, and wannabe David Tennant. Hey, can I pull up a side profile? How's that? Is that good? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, Doctor Who Flux continues with War of the Sontarans, episode 2, which premiered two hours ago, as of recording this, of course. Uh, so it's very fresh on my mind. I took a slew of notes on this one, so... Uh, you can expect these videos to get a lot longer as I want to cover pretty much every scene and what I felt about it, what I liked, what I didn't like, so I can gain a whole picture of my thoughts as I, as this came out. And then by the end, once we've seen the whole picture, we can really reflect on the experience that was Series 13 of my favorite TV show of all time. But uh, before we get into this story, let's do a little recap on Episode 1, the Halloween Apocalypse. Uh, it's an episode that was pretty much all set up. We didn't have anything in terms of focus for the story. Where we were just, I mean, it was mainly the Dogman story, so I guess that's what it was about. But it was mainly setting up everything in Flux. Vendor, the Flux, Weeping Angels, Swarm, and Azure, which are the names of the skeleton people that I found out after watching this episode, so that was fun. Uh, I might just call them the skeleton people going forward because it's easier. But those are their names. And uh, Dogman and Dan and a bunch of other shit that I can't even fucking remember. Uh, that was a lot of shit going on in that story. Uh, and the characterization was pretty inconsistent. Uh, if you're curious what I thought about that episode, I've done a review on it. Talking about a bunch of shit that happens in it. Oh, and by the way, uh, thank you so much for watching those reviews. I wasn't really expecting a ton going into it. I realized that Flux was airing, and I was like, oh, Doctor Who is kind of my thing. I should probably uh, do some reviews on that. It could be fun. But you guys actually uh, ate it up, and that was nice. Uh, so I hope my rambling is in any way educational or entertaining. Uh, I hope I'm uh, repaying the debt that was my awful Chibnall take in the first video essay, and is one of the, the bigger reasons that I'm actually making the remastered video essay, among other things. So, uh, you guys kind of get a little taste of what I think about Shibnall, having watched it all at this point anyway. And considering episode one was so heavy serialization, I was assuming that we would be continuing with that in this one. I would assume that it's not going to be focused in any way on any particular plot. We're just advancing the story of Flux forward. Uh, we're not getting any sort of focus at all. It would kind of be like, and excuse this example, this is a very popular show, so don't hate me. Uh, it'd be kind of like Stranger Things, where the episodes are pretty much completely serialized. It's not, you can look at the episodes individually, but it's more of, you know, the next chapter of the Stranger Things story. So I was assuming that's kind of the thing we were going to get with Flux, uh, that that the, they would just be exploring the plots going as they produce over the series, considering how episode one went. Which is funny, concerning this episode, because... I don't know if you've seen it, it's pretty much focused entirely on the Centaurans. We do get some, you know, it's set up of Flux going forward, but it's pretty much a Centauran story, which is upsetting because I was expecting Episode 1 to be the Weeping Angel story, and this is kind of proving me otherwise. But there's reassuring news that we are going to get a Weeping Angel solo story because Episode 4, and this is a little insider, so spoiler warning, Episode 4 is titled... Village Village of the Angels, I believe, is the title. So that's probably going to be a Weeping Angel solo story. So we can all thank God that we're getting that finally. Or be terrified. Uh, we probably have some cause for concern considering uh, it's Chibnall. But, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. This is episode two, War of the Sontarans. This has been more than enough preamble. Let's get into the shit. I don't actually mean that, but, you know, we'll give it a fair shake, as always. Going into this episode, I assumed that most of the plot points of episode 1 would be solved by, ooh, magic, like it is in most of Chibnall and Doctor Who uh, as a whole, let's be fair. Uh, in Chibnall, most of the finales and most plot points are resolved by fucking inane bullshit, uh, but in, in Doctor Who as a whole, the cliffhangers have never, never been anything to write home about. Uh, you know, you think of something like human nature, where it's like, choose which one will die, your friend or your lover. And then it gets resolved by, well, it gets resolved by Tim opening the watch, and also by Martha doing martial arts to get 
the sister in a chokehold. So cliffhangers are never, never much, but uh, I had particularly low expectations for this. So I assumed that the TARDIS getting eaten by the Flux and the whole, oh, I'm going to die cliffhanger would be just nothing. So we'll see if I was correct. And uh, I also called that when we see, because in the trailers, we see that uh, the 13th Doctor has a new coat. It's kind of inversed colors of the one that she has. It's a navy coat with uh, gray, you know, highlights and a hoodie. So I wanted to call that. I guarantee the moment that the new coat is introduced, it's going to be treated like some big fucking deal. And new costumes in Doctor Who for the characters never been a big deal. The biggest deal it's ever been is Matt Smith holding up the tweed and the big purple coat and then throwing the tweed. That's literally all the drama that we get concerning the Doctor's wardrobe uh, throughout Modern Who. So I assumed that when we finally get that new coat, it's going to be like, it's a new coat, everybody applaud, or something. Uh, we didn't actually see the coat in this episode, but uh, we do see it in the next time trailer for Once Upon a Time, episode three, so uh, that's my my call. I guarantee, I put money on it, that when we see the new coat, it's going to be a huge fucking moment. So anyway, let's finally get into it. We have the cold open, episode two, War of the Sontarans. We hear the cloister bells, the uh, familiar TARDIS cloister bells. I comment on how I love that sound. These are obviously me going through the notes. And then we open on the Doctor's face in monochrome. I believe it's monochrome. It might just be desaturated. So we pan out, and the picture comes into color. Uh, it's all distorted. We don't know where we are. And then we look up, and there's this mysterious floating house. And Jodie Whittaker puts her hand out to it. And then some funky cutting happens, and then the house is gone. So that was... Uh, Another plot point that we're getting in Flux, I think it was a house, it was, a, it was the one moment, so I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was a floating house that I saw. Uh, it could have just been a mistake, to be honest. It was on screen for all of five seconds in the entire episode, so. But I did see it. So uh, we pan out, everything's a bit more clear, we see that we're in some sort of gray battlefield somewhere. Uh, we see that Yaz and Dan are with the Doctor, so they've been teleported from the TARDIS to here. We don't know why that happened. We find out later that the TARDIS is here as well. So it's not like the TARDIS like, got destroyed and teleported them somewhere. The TARDIS is here and functional. So we just kind of got out of the flux by what essentially happens off screen or, you know, insane plot contrivance. Uh, so, that happened. But right now, we're, we don't know where we are. The Doctor, Dan, and Yaz are climbing all over the corpses of the battlefield. And then we see a random lady in a historical dress, something very old school, we can gather. And she attacks them, asks them why they're here, accuses them of, like, stealing from the corpses, like they're some sort of pillagers. And then uh, we get some heavy exposition after some dialogue that this is the 1850s. And Jodie Whittaker jumps into her... Well, it's not Jodie's fault, of course, but Chris Chibnall's favorite thing to do in, <laughs> in his run of Doctor Who is uh, have insane exposition dumps about history. Uh, so uh, what happens here is we don't know what time period we're in, but we see the dress... And then I'm assuming there's some... I don't really remember what the dialogue is exactly, but I'm assuming the lady tells them that they're in the 1850s. And then Jodie Whittaker immediately tells them that this is the 1850s. We are here. This is what's happening. This is who this person is. She's very important. And it's so fucking awful, this dialogue. And it happens so frequently. I don't know why he does it. I don't fucking know why. It's every... It's literally every single time. Mm, I don't know where we are. Where is this place? And then somebody says something, and then Jodie Whittaker goes, Oh, we're here, guys. We're here. This is this person. We're in this here. This is what happened. Here's an entire index of everything that happened in the 1850s and why it is important. Obviously, dramatized version of that, but it's pretty much how it feels every single time. It's so heavy-handed. Uh, but that's my very artfully uh, articulated depiction of that scene. 
<laughs> but yeah, uh, we can, and to be fair, we can compare this to other scenes where, you know, the Doctor doesn't know where they are, and then we get some exposition of him finding out where they are. Uh, and here I cited uh, the fires of Pompeii, where the Doctor and Donna arrive in ancient Rome, or what they think is ancient Rome, and then realize it's Pompeii. And then the Doctor says, we're in Pompeii, and it's Volcano Day. And then we cut to the opening credits, which is, you know, quick and to the point and not a misplaced educational monologue like it is every time in Chibnall, as I quote myself. And I agree. It's very forced. Uh, it's very awful dialogue and happens so damn frequently. The inconsistent characterization seems to be returning in this episode. So that was a huge red flag that things really weren't improving. Uh, but, you know, it is the one line after all, so no real reason to ring the alarm bells just yet, but that's what I took note of. And then we have some gunfire from somewhere, and the Doctor, Dan, Yaz, and this random lady, well, you know, a historical figure that I don't even really remember the name of, because uh, they had such a hard time referring to this character by their name. They just referred to as Miss whatever her last name may be. I genuinely don't remember. Uh, she was played well, of course, but... Uh, they really could have done a better job of integrating her into the story. Uh, she seemed like a historical character for historical sakes, but, you know, I digress. Uh, but then we get the uh, the reveal of the Santarans, so, you know, they take cover from gunfire or, you know, soldiers or whatever it may be. And the Doctor is like, who are the soldiers? Why are they here? Or something. And then uh, the lady says they're Santarans, so we are supposed to gather that the humans know who the Santarans are and aren't surprised by that, so that's a thing that we're going to have to look for going forward. And then we get the Santaran entrance, you've seen it in the trailers of them on the horse, takes the helmet off, and then we get the classic Santarha chant uh, into the uh, title card, which was very nice, that kind of tugged at my nostalgia strings, so good job Chris for that. And then we get the uh, title theme, and I elaborate again on how I do think this is the best title theme, uh, at least the way it came in on my speakers in my uh, dungeon. It uh, came in very good with its uh, with its mastery. It came in uh, swinging, so it was very well uh, mixed. So the mastery of this uh, this theme is very good, and obviously, you know what what is remixed of it from the old Chibnall theme is is uh, very well done. So good jobs again for composing that. Uh, it's one of your standout tracks, my friend. Uh, so then, we get the uh, title card, of course, and then we cut into uh, Vinder. We see Vinder again. We cut, and it's his face. Somewhere. We don't know where, but it's Vinder again. If you remember, this is one of the standouts of episode one, along with Dogman. So I was very excited to see him, if I'm honest. I thought his characterization was pretty much flawless, and he was a lot of fun. I must played well, of course. So we see him, and he's uh, in a temple somewhere. And uh, a mysterious floating, talking pyramid comes up to him asking if he can repair what they're referring to. We don't exactly know. So I guess, I think Vinder introduces himself. He says, I'm Vinder from here. This is what I do. For some reason he does that to the pyramid, but, uh, you know, he can talk. So we can assume it is intelligent. So, you know, it's not, not too out of the ordinary. He is an alien after all. So Vinder follows this... Uh, floating pyramid into a room. I think this is when we see the room. It might be later when we see the scene again, but uh, it's just a big temple somewhere. It's the temple of, what is it called? Hang on. Apparently I did not take note of it. It's like Apisis or something. Temple of Apis. It's an A word. It ends with Sis. But basically it's a really important temple and we're supposed to care about it for some reason. Anyway, that's our vendor scene. He talks to a floating pyramid that asks him if he can repair and then he follows it. So, uh, that's another thread that we're setting up. And then we cut back to Yaz. I have to list the entire fucking alphabet. The Doctor, Yaz, Dan, and uh, this random lady. Who, I don't. I need to come up with a name for her. Uh, 1850s lady. Let's just call her that. So we're in 1850s. We're following these characters. We don't know where we are. We're on some battlefield somewhere. The Santarans are here. We have some mysteries to solve. <laughs> So we get introduced to the livelihood of these 1850s people. This lady runs a hotel uh, where she's a uh, basically a field medic to this war with the Santarans that uh, is fictional. 
and then uh, Dan and Yaz literally just disappear out of the scene. And this happens, he's stealing this from Fugitive of the Jadoon, with companions just disappearing out of thin air with no explanation. Uh, she says it's like the temporal energy of the TARDIS or something that is making them disappear. It's just a reason to have subplots in this episode, but that felt really structured and unnatural. But they both get teleported to different places. So now it's just the Doctor on Earth in the 1850s. Uh, and then we have an honestly tense scene that's well cut, edited, and scored, where the Doctor uh, runs to the TARDIS to try and save uh, Yaz and Dan from wherever they may be. And uh, the TARDIS door is not on the TARDIS, which is a continuation from episode one, where the TARDIS door is disappearing and reappearing in parts of the interior. Now we see that happening on the exterior, where the TARDIS door is just missing. You go around the sides, there's no TARDIS door. It's a fun idea. So that was that was a good scene. I liked how it was cut and performed, obviously. And it had some cool sci-fi concepts. Uh, so I liked that. And then we follow Dan first. So Dan is teleported home. And thank God Dan told me, or just said to himself, I'm home. As if I couldn't recognize the street that he lived on from episode one. So we have even more dialogue of characters explaining what's happening in the scene at any given time. So again, we have this poisonous uh, flaw in Chibnall's writing where characters are constantly breaking their characters or whatever to say what's in the scene. I guess it doesn't really apply for Dan because he's characterized as a guy who talks to himself, not because he's actually characterized that way, but because Chibnall likes to have his characters talk to themselves and say, I'm home to nobody while he looks at his street where he lives. There's no reason why we can't just have a scene where Dan looks at the street and his expression and the acting tell us this is a place that he recognizes. And then we, we having watched episode one, can say, that's episode one. And as opposed to just this, these two words to tell me, oh yeah, you, I don't even need my eyes. Just tell me what's happening in the episode. And, uh, you know, I'll get a good picture of it. So that was a kind of infuriating line for me. Uh, and then we see that the Santarans are in modern day Earth, which is weird because... You know, they were in 1850s, and they're also in the modern day at the same time, where we just were, and they weren't there. So we have more mysteries to solve in this episode. And uh, so Dan's walking around his modern day. We see the Santaran ships attacking people. So there are Santarans on the street, being Santarans. And then we get more new characters introduced in Dan's parents, who are here. Uh, Dan is getting chased by Santarans, and then his parents come from behind whack them on their weak spot on the back of their neck they just know that that's there and at the time i was like wow that's a contrivance but later on they do of course say that they know how to do that because they've been here for a while and word gets around so i felt like that was a pretty realistic uh thing that would have happened if the Suntarans were here and imprisoning humans for that long they would have learned about that so it was okay but at the moment i was like god damn it another contrivance but we have new characters, which is very scary, considering how much we already have established in Flux. But, you know, we have that. And then we cut away to Yaz. So we find out that Yaz was teleported to the same uh, temple that uh, Vinder was teleported to. So these characters are about to meet. They have not met yet. And we have some honestly terrible interpersonal dialogue of Yaz talking to herself. It's just a quip about how she needs a GPS to know where she is, since this happens a lot. Very unnatural dialogue. Uh, I, I wrote, yeah, this is a new character every time we see her. Uh, which kind of feels correct. And then, out of the fucking blue, and I do mean this, we see 1820s Liverpool Man from the beginning of episode one, who is in one scene. Again, why is he here? Where did he come from? What's happening there? More questions without answers that obviously will be answered as he goes on. But we see him, uh, which was exciting. And he honestly has very good exchange with uh, Yaz. They have some dialogue. And I think Liverpool Man is written very well. Uh, he obviously speaks of his era 
and uh, it doesn't feel clunky at all. I, I like this was actually a really, really well written exchange. It was punctual. It was clever. It was, it was a nice uh, witty exchange between the two characters before Liverpool Man disappears from the episode, and we never see him again. So I feel like this is the uh, guy who is going to be in only one scene in all of the episodes of Flux. So far, two out of six, uh, that is true. He is only in one scene in each episode, so uh, that's going to be his thing. <laughs> it's almost like a meme that this guy just shows up for one scene in each episode. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to episode three, where we see this man for one scene. Uh, but honestly, he's a nice, fun character, so when we do see him, he's kind of cool. But... Uh, he showed up, and I don't think Yaz and Vinder meet in this cut of this uh, scene. They meet later, so we cut away to the Doctor back in on Earth in the 1850s at this uh, you know rest stop on the uh, battlefield, and uh, the Doctor is talking with the local people, saying that uh, she's stuck here now because the TARDIS doesn't have a door, and uh, we get this new character, this uh, commander character of the battle, and. I don't know what it is, but this whole scene feels really surreal and like it doesn't make sense. This whole war scene, it's depicted very strangely where we're supposed to believe that there's this gigantic war with the Sontarans happen and we see no soldiers at all, no corpses, not even any Sontarans, but there's this big fucking gruesome war going on that's that's going to happen. But this commander walks in, he's, he's looking at maps of the world and uh, the doctor and him have an exchange where they talk about the Sontarans and why they're here now. We discover that uh, basically what happened is uh, the Sontarans, through some weird timey-wimey shit with the Flux, uh, inherited Asia. Asia is now Sontar as, as a country. And we can kind of piece together what's happening. This is to do with the Flux and how time is all fucking weird. So by some magic coincidence, uh, history is now all different and the Sontarans have been here for a while. And uh, they've been doing some bad shit. So uh, we get that reveal. And naturally, to follow it, we have another amazing Chris Chibnall exposition dump where Jodie Whittaker talks to the audience and tells us all of the mysteries that have been established with these new lines of dialogue. She tells us that uh, Asia is not supposed to be Sontar. It's supposed to be Asia, as we could have gathered. Uh, and then she wonders why that is and says that it's all wrong. So we have more of this. This dialogue was not in episode one at all. I'm very not happy to see it again, <laughs> but uh, it's there, and it feels very clunky, as it always is in Chibnall, where the doctor talks to the camera again, and all the characters in the scene just stop talking and let her dump all these fucking words onto the audience. So we got that, and didn't love it. It's very curious for me, reviewing these episodes, because I've gotten so accustomed to this Chibnall writing, where we don't understand the concept of show, don't tell. We have to explain every plot point that gets established, and run it into the ground through the dialogue that I don't even notice it when it happens. I don't even really, con it's like, oh, yep, this is, yep, okay. I better turn off my brain for the next minute so that Chibnall can make sure all the six-year-olds are up to date. When in reality, all the six-year-olds had tuned out all the shit when it started. They wanna, they wanna see the doctor fight the Sontarans. I honestly don't love being pessimistic with this shit, but one of my absolute fucking least favorite things about Chibnall is the way these are handled. It's not techno babble. It's not just this rapid snappy dialogue. It's just the doctor talking to the audience. It's so fucking heavy handed. I really hate the dialogue. This could be drafted three times over and just be so much better and wittier as akin to what the doctor might actually say. So we have that scene and then we kind of walk away from that and then we have some uh, character moment dialogue with 1850s lady uh, where she talks about who she is and why she does what she does as a field medic and taking care of people in the Sontaran War. Uh, so that was the scene that we got. 
again, this the characterization of this historical figure feels really uh, both pointless and not well written, obviously. I don't think this person actually does anything in the story. I'm really searching my memory. I don't think she does a single thing. She runs around with the doctor. I think that's pretty much all she does. I don't know why she's here. It's just to have a historical figure in the episode. I hope you guys don't think I'm being too pessimistic with this. I feel like I'm bow striking a lot of ways with how much I'm nagging at this, but these are just notes that I wrote as I watched. I sat on the couch. That's something I didn't like. I didn't like that. But yeah, that's just how I feel. I promise I'm giving this episode a fair shake. I sat down. I wrote the good stuff. I wrote the bad stuff. There's just so much bad stuff. It's just that I feel like I'm endlessly complaining about this episode, and I hope that that makes sense. Uh, please let me know if I'm being unfair to this episode. I don't know, I just had so many problems with it. It felt so much clumsier than the other ones. Anyway, we find out that this 18... Oh yeah, she does do something. She captures the Sontaran. That's the one thing she does. There is a Sontaran that's injured that she captures and has prisoner in the back of this place. So that's the one thing that she does. Didn't have to be her that did it, but she did it. So that's the scene that we get next. We interrogate the Sontaran, who is actually played by the dude who plays Strax. You can tell by his voice and the way that the makeup was on his face. I thought it was Strax for a second. I wrote a note asking if it was Strax so I could call it out when it might have gotten revealed. It's not Strax, uh, which kind of sucks, but, you know, it's okay. But we have some interrogative dialogue where uh, the doctor is basically bargaining f to speak with the general of the Sontarans in exchange for information on the doctor, who the Sontarans don't know is her. So it's really fun dialogue where the Sontaran is very angry at the doctor because they're enemies and then jody is kind of egging him on i think it was uh, pretty well written but it ends with the most just moment of the entire episode that was so unbelievably frustrating watching so i'm going to walk through this this whole scene the doctor is saying oh i'm not the doctor i will give you information on the doctor the doctor is here he's here and he's 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 planning against you and the Santarans are really angry about that and he's, he's he wants to be freed so that he can go tell the general and uh they can de go defeat the doctor and he's like he, and jody was like yeah yeah i'll free you but you have to promise that you won't kill me because i have information on the doctor who i am not and he says yeah i won't kill you i'll spare you and then the scene ends with jody whitaker Brandishing your sonic screwdriver, sonicking the chains, freeing the Sontaran. And he doesn't bat a fucking eye at the sonic device. Wielded by the doctor, he doesn't question it a fucking ounce. It's so endlessly stupid. And it's such a tiny moment, it got on my nerves all really hard. You know, Sontarans may be dumb. But he knows who the Doctor is. He knows that he flies into TARDIS. He's an enemy of them. He wields a sonic screwdriver. He would notice that. The dumbest thing to probably happen in all of Chris Chibnall's run of Doctor Who. And it is just completely insignificant. Yet, it really got on my nerves. I Because the whole scene is setting up the fact that they don't know that she's the Doctor. I knew it was coming the whole time. I knew he would, she would end by cutting loose with the sonic screwdriver. But I didn't know they were going to gloss over it. It's so stupid. I, I literally dropped my jaw. Uh, so then I had a comment on 1850s Lady. I said that she's weird to me. The other historical characters have some flair to them. But this one feels bland and undercharacterized beyond the fact that the doctor says, Oh, she's important which is pretty much how I feel about her. Uh, and then we get the Sontaran returning to the Sontaran army, talking to the general about information on the doctor. He gets executed because it's weakness to on Sontarans, whatever. And then we get a new Sontaran chant, Sontar Ho, instead of Sontar Ha. Which happened. Uh, I thought that was kind of dumb. And then we finally cut away from the doctor on Earth to Dan again who I forgot was in the episode, because there are three 
big subplots that we are cutting back to routinely throughout the episode. A, B, and C plots. A, B, C, A, B, C. And this isn't like episode one where we're setting up a ton of tiny stuff over and over throughout the episode to make it super convoluted. This is really big chunks of a lot of stories that we are expected to keep up with. ABC plots over and over, big like 10 minute cuts of each scene back and forth stacked against each other. So by the time you cut to something like Dan, you forget that he was even in the episode with how much there is. But yeah, they're hiding in a car from the Sontarans, and this is where we discover that they found out about the Sontaran weak spot through word of mouth, uh, which again felt fairly realistic with how humans would have reacted in this scenario of invasion. So, uh, you know, that kind of made more sense in retrospect. And then we have a weird moment where Dan is with his family. They are approaching, like, a Centauran ship, I believe it is. And he has a strange hero moment where he's saying, I'll go on ahead. You guys, I mean, it's not, he, obviously there's more finesse to that dialogue, which I felt was good dialogue, but as a moment for the character, it feels like it's just a reason to get Dan on his own. Because, you know, Dan is characterized as selfless, but he doesn't know anything about the Santarans and how to attack them. He's never done it before. You'd think he'd want his parents, who are clearly experienced with taking out Santarans because they just did, uh, to be with him. Because he just teleported in from nowhere. He has no knowledge of this area at all. But he's like, no, I'll go, I'll go my own. So I felt like that was a weird moment. Uh, that really felt fabricated for uh, just Dan to be on his own. And then, just when I'd forgotten her, we cut back to Yaz and uh, Vinder. And they finally meet in this scene. And we have some dialogue. Uh, and I had really big problems with Yaz in this scene, where I say Yaz just asks questions and is portrayed so inconsistently in this one scene. It's like a parody of an independent character. Uh, so in this scene, we have Yaz and Vinder having some rapport, where they, uh, have some back and forth dialogue, uh, riddling each other questions of where they are, what's going on, and what the temple is. Who are the triangles flying around, and who are these... Oh yeah, also there's like holograms of people that we don't know who they are uh, that appear like holograms around this kind of central area of the uh, temple. We don't know who they are. And uh, so they have some dialogue here. And it's such a ham-fisted interpretation of an independent character. It's like Chris Chibnall approached a line and was like, in this line, I'm going to establish to the audience that Yaz yeah, is an independent character. But he did that with every single one of her lines. Like, there's a really bad one where uh, they're, at, like, riddling each other questions. What's going on? Bender's asking what's going on. And then Yaz is like, I'm going to need more information. And she's just, she asks Vinder what's going on in the most cartoony, forced way possible. I think the dialogue in this episode is really painful. I'm going to be honest. I've kind of come to that conclusion at this point. So, uh, Yaz continues to be a little bit, a little bit, uh, inconsistently characterized in this episode. Uh, and then the flying pyramids talk to Yaz about time and the Mori, which we don't know about, so, uh, uh, that's another setup of something. And then I have a note that I've already kind of talked about where I say, this episode feels more like a traditional A plot, B plot kind of story, but with three different cutaway plots. But the elements in this one are slipping back into Chibnall idiosity. It appears I took episode one for granted. Uh, and then we come back to Dan, where uh, we see uh, Sontaran firing swords. Basically, he's infiltrating the Sontaran base on his own. He's sneaking around, seeing all this fucked up Sontaran shit going on. Uh, this subplot feels really pointless and only makes the decision that we have three subplots in this story feel kind of pointless because one of the subplots is just Dan walking around on his own. And then we finally cut back to the Doctor after two big scenes of there's nothing. So uh, the Doctor is shooting a loud thing that you've seen in the trailers uh, that alerts everyone. And then uh, we have the Sontaran General approach the Doctor. This is their big showdown where they talk to each other. And uh, so we have this whole standoff for the sake of it. And we have an absolutely terrible reveal that this person who has information on the doctor actually is the doctor and but what i mean by that is it's a throw she just immediately says you're you're talking to the doctor and he's like what and then the dialogue continues 
So that was kind of silly, considering how much effort we put into establishing that this is a big secret that's going to be revealed in a big doctorish moment later. This has been a secret for a couple scenes at this point. So this this one throwaway line felt dumb as hell. Uh, and then this dialogue continues where the Doctor's basically saying, you can't invade Earth, and then the Suntarans are like, ha, no. And then we get a Lynx name drop, which is the name of the first Suntaran ever in Doctor Who back in the Time Warrior. So uh, we had another little reference there. So that was cool. Uh, and then the dialogue continues. They're basically talking about why they chose 1850s to invade Earth. So we have some plot moving dialogue here, and then we get a nice, honestly, a nice joke where uh, the Suntaran says that he picked 1850s because he wanted to ride a horse, along among other things. So I, th I thought that was kind of a silly thing because in the trailers, everyone had a grievance with the Suntarans riding a horse. Why are they riding a horse aside from iconicism? So as a justification, I think this is kind of silly and... Uh, you know, fitting. And then we get the rug pulled from under us, the doctor saying, I'm gonna stop you, I speak for humanity, you will not invade this planet, and then the humans, the commander, and his armies, he puts the gun to the doctor's head and says, no you don't speak for us, and he wants to go to war, that's the whole thing with this. So we have a big whole, uh, humans are dumb moment, quoting myself, it's an alright moment, but I feel the doctor should be more literally frustrated, flustered, and speechless, at their idiosity as opposed to being condescending to their actions. Basically, the whole dialogue in the scene is that we want to go to war, and the doctor's like, don't do this. You're making a mistake. I feel like the way that this has been staged, where this guy just keeps being an idiot, wanting to go to war, and he's so focused on that that the doctor would just be, just like, stop being stupid and either be played for a comedic moment or, like, a genuinely frustrating moment, as opposed to this cookie-cutter dialogue of, no. So uh, that was my comment on that. She seems to underact as a character for this moment. The dialogue feels underwritten for how big this moment is. So uh, that was my comment on that. And then we have the big battle between the humans and the Sontarans. The humans are dumb. They want to go to war. Um, they're all foolish. Um, that's basically the whole thing with this. And this is another big grievance that I have. But this big battle comes out of nowhere. There are... So many soldiers in this big battle that just showed up. We didn't see a single fucking soldier aside from the commander the entire episode. All these Suntarans and soldiers just popped out for this scene. Uh, so I felt like that was a really surprising moment that just happened to have a big battle scene. I say it's so weird. Like, there's so many soldiers, we should have seen them. So that's how I feel about that. Uh, and then we have a scene where the doctor's frustrated about that the humans are going to war, and then she basically, uh, does the equivalent of chloroforming a soldier, uh, for literally no reason. I suppose most of the confusion comes down to the fact that I'm in the States, and I was watching this on BBC America, which runs ads. We don't pay TV licenses over here across the pond. Uh, it's all, uh, advertising. So we had an ad break right after this chloroform scene, so I don't know how it tied into the, uh, grander plot of what the doctor does after this per se because i had to watch 10 minutes of car ads but uh it felt like a weird scene i don't think it really factored in too much but she basically just like and the, she knocks the guy out uh so i felt that uh it was weird let alone out of character but that fucking ship has sailed everything the doctor does is just wrong as i quote myself bit of you know a dramatized version of that but uh you know, she does so many little things that I feel are out of character for how the Doctor, as I understand, him or her, would act. So, uh, you know, I feel like it's just kind of wasted criticism at this point. Uh, and then we cut away to Dan again, who I forget about every time. So I say, Dan is still in this episode. What is he doing? Why is this happening? <laughs> and then I say, I swear if this doesn't pay off by the end, I'm going to break something. Basically, we still have this Dan subplot where he's just wandering around the Suntarn base. <laughs> and then he, he climbs up a tower, and then the opening notes of Imperial March from Star Wars plays, and we cut away. So that was our one-minute cutback to Dan. I don't understand why he couldn't just join Yaz, and this episode had been so much more tight, and Dan would have had some actual people to bounce off of in his subplot. 
And then I go on to say his scenes do nothing at all, literally nothing, besides establishing that Sontarans are on modern-day Earth, which is a hell of a reason to make an entire subplot dedicated to your episode. It's filler by definition. Uh, so we'll see how that pays off and ties up by the end of his little subplot here. But in retrospect, I do think that he could have easily just been with Yaz, or at the very least have most of his scenes trimmed. But I honestly don't know how to handle that. I feel like I might have just rewritten his entire subplot to be a bit more interesting. But I felt it was omega pointless. And then, out of the blue, we have Swarm and Azure literally just appear in the temple place. And if you don't know their names, that is the skeleton people from episode one. The man skeleton and the lady skeleton. Those are their names. I figured that out from watching this episode. They reveal their names later. They just appear in this episode in the third act. Uh, and then I go off on a tangent on how uh, apparently uh, people like these skeleton people and think they're intimidating, at least from social media and uh, where I keep up to date on that. Uh, and then I go on to say there's a difference between portraying a character as powerful and it being cool as opposed to portraying a character that feels like a genuine threat to the characters with compelling motivations. These two are evil for the sake of it, and we barely see them, and I don't understand how people think they're well-written. Uh, in my opinion, they're super disappointing as villains, as they appeared here in the middle of this episode for the first time. Uh, so at that juncture, I feel like, yeah, we don't understand their motivations, aside from the fact that they have history with the Doctor, uh, and they're just kind of stereotypically super powerful, but honestly, that feels more of a trap than anything to have a character that is really powerful. Because when you share scenes with the main characters, you have to be constantly asking, why isn't he just killing them if he really wants to defeat them as an antagonist? He can disintegrate people with his mind, along with other things that get established later. These guys are insanely powerful. So I feel like it's just a really dangerous thing that I think Chibnall is going to, with the way he's handled his villains, fuck up massively. So then we cut back to the battle on Earth, uh, where we find out that the Suntarans killed all the human soldiers, to nobody's surprise. And then we see the Doctor again on a Suntaran spaceship, because they've got, she's gone off with uh, 1850s lady. And uh, I had another comment here, which is kind of silly. Uh, there's so many historical people wandering around alien spaceship sets in Chibnall's run. In Spyfall, Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror... Uh, can you hear me? I think. Maybe not. But there's a few of them where they're just people in old school clothing walking around futuristic sets. Uh, it's just kind of a weird thing that I noticed. And then we cut back to Dan again, uh, where he's vlogging on the Sontaran ship. Comes out of nowhere, naturally. But uh, he vlogs in the Sontaran ship. He's talking to his camera. So we find out that the reason... This Dan subplot exists entirely is so that he can get into the Sontaran room, access the Sontaran computer, and then he could finally talk to the Doctor, where they share some dialogue talking about what the Sontaran plan is. And this whole Dan vlogging thing that's happening is so the Doctor can figure out what the Sontaran's plan is through scanning the videos from his phone. Again, it's fabricated so that this episode can resolve itself. Honestly, I'm mentally exhausted by how much contrivance is wrapping up this one. Uh, but we actually have a good line, finally, where uh, 1850s lady uh, is kind of talking with Dan on the aside through the computer webcam zoom thing, uh, where she's, she honestly, she's just following the doctor around, and she says, uh, I don't understand any of this, uh, which was delivered very well as a joke. And as kind of a character line for uh, this person. I thought that was a nice moment that got a smile out of me. And then we end that scene with Dan getting captured by Suntarans. And then we cut away to uh, Yaz and Vinder again. And then Swarm and Azir uh, appear into the scene because that's the last time we saw them. And then we finally get them confronting main characters. Obviously, they don't kill them because uh, plot armor. Uh, but uh, honestly, good scene for these two. Uh, it, we are really, really starved of characterization scenes for these two. We basically, all we know about them is that they're really bad guys. Uh, but we actually have some dialogue where uh, they're showing off how powerful they are. So I say, honestly, a good characterization scene. 
finally all the people on Instagram have valid opinions concerning how these guys are well written. Uh, in this one scene, it was a good characterization scene that I thought was quite fun, where uh, they were quite flippant of uh, Vinder and Yaz's uh, dilemma. So it was a good scene. And then, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> out of nowhere, and I mean that, but it's not even a problem for me, and completely saving this episode, Dogman appears and saves Dan from the Santarans. And I almost squealed seeing him because I was so starved of things that I liked. And I was just very happy to see him. He was awesome. And again, he's, he's written very well. He was very funny and played well. So that was really awesome. So they have a quick exchange of how they hate each other, Dan and Dogman. On, funnily enough, I only like Dan when he's sharing a scene with Dogman. That's the only time he's witty and characterized well. Uh, in other situations, he's he just feels super weird as a character. And then we're back to the Doctor, uh, where the Commander appears. And this is where we get the message of the story. At least it is to be determined that it is the message of the story, that uh, generals and higher-ups in the military are dumb and get the soldiers killed. I say that because the Doctor literally has a line where she says, Commanders get soldiers killed or something. And because of the stupidity or whatever. So that felt like the episode's message and obviously has insane problems with the way it's portrayed. It just feels super clunky and obvious from a million miles away. As a message, it doesn't really tell me anything about why I should care. And then we finally have the wrap-up of this episode. And my voice is shredded. I've been talking for a while here. Uh, the Doctor asks for a pointy stick. And then we have a big funny scene where the Doctor explains... How to defeat the Santarans. And I'm sorry if you're exhausted by how much I had problems with in this episode, but we have the dumbest thing yet coming up. So, Chibnall introduces a new plot point to the Santarans that they can't cope with the Earth's atmosphere because they're not used to it. They're used to Santar's atmosphere, and that's why they wear the suits. So every 24 hours, they have to refill their suit energy. Which immediately contradicts Strack's existence. He almost never wears his suit following his first appearance in A Good Man Goes to War, and has been on Earth for months and is led to believe to be years, and he's just totally fine. And it, it probably also contradicts uh, Suntaran Stratagem and the Poison Sky. They probably sieged Earth for far more than 24 hours. Again, they had teleports back to their ship, so maybe they could have refueled. But Strax as a character completely contradicts this fucking plot point. Uh, and again, it's just fabricated so that the Doctor can defeat the Suntarans by draining their energy systems, and then they have to retreat because... They all die because they don't have energy for their suits. And then it's also a bit of a thematic contradiction where the whole episode the Doctor's been saying that don't attack the Santarans, you're just going to get people killed. But then at the end, she resolves it by marching up to attack the Santarans with soldiers to back her up. Uh, so she kind of becomes the whole thing that she's uh, talking about. She's leading these soldiers into danger. Uh, what she has herself has described as a pointless and, you know, it's a, it's a fight that's done before it's over. Obviously, this is like a sabotage mission, so it's not, you know, a complete contradiction in terms, but uh, it felt like a bit of a thematic contradiction immediately following a scene where she's talking about how higher-ups are bad, which in itself is a terrible message. So uh, when I was watching this, I had insane problems with this whole invention of Chris Chibnall's that the Santarans need energy for their suits to breathe on Earth. So I just kind of elaborated on that in my notes. I say, what a dumb idea. This is so dumb, dude. The Santarans continue to be no threat at all. I was very upset that this was invented for the Santarans to defeat them. Because going forward, every time we see the Santarans, we're going to know, just sabotage their suits, and then they'll be gone within a day. So it's just kind of so fucking stupid. And just an excuse to get them out of the plot. And then we go back to Dogman, and I love him. And the, his dialogue continues to be funny and awesome. So we get some exposition of 
that uh, Dan and Dogman are still linked. And he runs a Sontaran ship that he has hijacked with Dan into the fleet and blows them all up. So again, it's just a reason to wrap up the Sontarans in this one episode. Uh, and then they, they jump out the chute, which re- looks remarkably like the Into the Dalek chute. Uh, with the ring lights around it. You've seen it in the trailers. It looks very similar to that. Uh, and then I can, we come back to the Sontarans getting defeated. And I continue to have problems and be infuriated by this plot point that has been established by this episode. And I say, Doctor defeats the Sontarans with one simple move. How daft. What a joke. I shouldn't be surprised. I was apparently infuriated with this decision. And obviously I, I maintain that. It was really dumb and fabricated very clearly for the story. Just to get the Sontarans out of the story. And despite, you know, tricking the Sontarans and getting them to leave, we still get this ending where the commander man, who is still dumb and wants to kill things because he's an idiot human, uh, rigs some dynamite to blow up the ships for literally no reason other than he's dumb and continues to be a thorn in the plot's side, slash just a device to save the Doctor from committing genocide and, you know, rid the, the uh, wretched plot of the Sontarans so they can't come back and uh, be here. And then the TARDIS is magically functional again. The Doctor just says, please, and then the door materializes. And she goes and saves everyone from uh, where they are. And then I go on to elaborate that uh, I feel like this whole thing with the TARDIS disintegrating, uh, the Doctor, as a character, should care more about the TARDIS being fucked up. Uh, Like, that's kind of a huge fucking deal and could fuck up a lot, the fact that her TARDIS can just lose its door and then all of a sudden they're trapped somewhere. So I feel like that's probably a problem she should take care of, but but, uh, no, we're not. We're not going to take care of that. And then I go on to shill Dogman and say, We love Dogman. Best part of Chibnall's run, without a doubt, aside from the entirety of The Haunting of Villa Diodati, which is not written by Chris Chibnall and is a fantastic episode. Uh, and then the Doctor and Swarm meet. Uh, there's some expeditional dialogue. Uh, Swarm and Azir continue to be decently characterized. And apparently the planet that this temple is on is called Time, which gets established. And then... Uh, so, and then Swarm exposits about the temple and what's going on because he's evil or something. And then we get our cliffhanger where Yaz and Vinder have been uh, have been put into the where these holograms of these people are in the temple big circular room. So they're all demonic and they have these holes in their heads. They're still alive, obviously. And then we get a cliffhanger where Swarm is threatening to kill Yaz if the Doctor doesn't do what he wants her to do, which we don't know what that is. Uh, so that's the cliffhanger that we get for episode two. And that's how it ends. It ends with uh, Azir counting down. She says one. And then he snaps his fingers. And that's, that's the cliffhanger for this one. So in summary, I've written elegant little uh, paragraph here that I will that I will uh, cite. In summary, Chibnall slips back into the contrivance that plagues his run of Doctor Who. Dogman and Vinder continue to be well characterized for some strange reason, but the message of the story feels simplified despite the hour runtime of the episode. The Santarans are wasted and are defeated by an insultingly stupid resolution that uh, breaks most of what we understand about the Santarans as villains. Dan's subplot feels pointless up until Dogman emerges. Yaz and pretty much everyone continue to have mixed bag dialogue into the episode, which Chibnall doesn't really understand how to write an honestly got independent companion referring to Yaz. Liverpool Man, which I literally forgot about as I was re- conducting this review because I've been talking for so long, uh, leaves just as quickly as he arrived. Uh, Swarm and Azir emerge and continue to just set up the rest of the episodes. But this episode's plot is so much worse than episode 1, mainly because it has to actually rely on the Sontaran plot for the first time, as opposed to set up the Doctor Who episode, which is what we got in episode 1. So uh, that was my review of War of the Sontarans. I had a slew of problems with this episode. My voice hurts. I've been talking for an hour and 22 minutes, as uh, as the recording says. So uh, let me know what you thought. Let me know if I was a bit too fair for this episode. I think it's important to note that uh, even though I had more bad things to say, 
I think I would have had a lot more bad things to say about episode one if I had taken notes on the little bits as I went through it, as I did with this episode. I took six pages of notes as opposed to, like, the ten uh, bullet points that I focused on in episode one. So, in a ratio, it might seem that I think this episode is just a train wreck. I think there's just a lot of little stuff in this one that, much like with most of Chidmel's run, is completely misunderstood clumsily written and you know resolved by contrivance and dumb shit that contradicts what we already know about the Santarans and most of Doctor Who as a whole uh, but it's important to note that with Flux we're going heavy serialization it is to be determined despite this episode kind of contradicting that with how much we focus on the Santarans overall that uh we're getting a lot of loose threads as we go through and maybe by the end it'll be resolved in a satisfying way Maybe not. With this one, I think there's a lot wrong with it, and uh, that's how I feel. So I'm going to give my voice a break. I hope you've all enjoyed. I'll see you all next week for episode three, Once Upon Time, which is far too similar to Twice Upon a Time's name. So we'll see if that one's better. Uh, you know, it's just a big fucking mystery, but, you know, we'll see. So thank you for watching. Bye.